Hello friends, it's me, Self-Critical Automaton, and it's time for chapter 15? Episode 1 of chapter 15, which I guess is episode 23? 22, overall? Um, of Bayonetta! And... <laughs> uh, we're nearly finished. This, uh... There's this chapter, then the next chapter, and then an epilogue, and then that's the entire game. I've been really enjoying it so far, and I hope you stick with me to the end. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, I just want to point out that my next project is going to be Mirror's Edge, which is one of my favourite games of all time, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, but after Mirror's Edge, I'm actually not sure what I want to record, and um, it's a pretty short game, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to post a poll on Twitter at some point. Make sure you go follow me there if you want to get updates about this sort of thing, um, and see what people are interested in me playing. And yeah, so other than that, it's time to jump straight into the game. And uh, yeah, if you think you've seen some nonsense so far, then you're about to see way more. Actually, this chapter's fairly mundane compared to the previous ones, but it's part of the escalation curve. This is the, the plateau so to contextualise the next bit of mon absolute nonsense. I swear I've heard exactly that moving stone sound effect before. Must come from a common library. Welcome back, little one. Mummy, where are we? It looks like someone's expecting us. Awfully nice of them to roll out the red carpet. Luca, you need to get one thing straight. He's the only straight thing here. Yeah, I know. I won't look after you, so don't screw up. I got things under control. Let's go. Stay next to me, little one. Daddy? What? Daddy, it's Daddy! Daddy? Of course, Mummy. Can't you hear him? Okay, Daddy, I'm coming. And I'll bring Mummy with me. Little one, wait! This way, Mummy! Little one! Little one! It's nice to see a man be the ineffectual sidekick who always gets left behind and trapped in things. Uh, so yeah, here we are in uh, the Ithobol group's building at the long last, after having ostensibly this entire plot having been intended to be a heist on this place. It's taken us a fascinating amount of time to actually get here. Um, so yeah, we start off with one of these easily missable bonus fights where you uh, kick the shit out of a statue. It's uh, fairly trivial by this point, you know. You can beat these things on autopilot if you've been playing, you know, solidly for a while. That said, I haven't really played in like a week because I've been extremely ill. So hopefully I'll equip myself well regardless. But uh, yeah. There's not a ton to say about this level, but it's it's kind of a boss rush, actually. Um, you start at the bottom of the tower and you fight your way to the top, as is traditional in so many different games. Um, the start at your bottom and work your way to the top of a tower is actually weirdly common as a game design trope, which makes sense because it's uh, an extremely easy thing to design around. Um, so yeah, having fucked up these two... Uh, griffin thingies. I still can't remember what they're called. Uh, we fly over here and um, so yeah I might have to edit out a few different coughing fits and um, so the timing for this episode might be a little bit off. It might be a bit longer or shorter than is normal but hey uh, if anything this series has shown that I cannot for the life of me predict how long an episode is going to be considering I varied from like 15 to what like 35? Uh, my aim is 20 so Anyway, um, 
A lot of the innards of this tower do have this same kind of um, sort of uh, regularized, futurist, vague, baroque situation going on. Um, like, if you look at these uh, banisters over here, they are kind of basically just... Yeah, I've seen like a ton of banisters that look like that in um, some real... Uh, Actually, it kind of has a 70s feel to me, but um, it does also have a kind of a 1930s futurist decadence thing going on. Speaking of decadence... So these guys are on fire, but for some reason you seem to be able to wail on them just fine. I think maybe uh, their um, armor means that you... Like, if you smash up the armor off of them... Ah, there we go. So, that means that these are the on-fire guys that you can fight ordinarily. Which is just interesting, because that's uh, been a consistent mechanic previously. So, as I said, this chapter is kind of a boss rush. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, uh, as all of the game's angel bosses return. But... This kind of industrial aesthetic, less so these kind of sunbursts and so on, but all of the actual kind of, like, chunky tech. Um, a lot of this stuff honestly looks exactly like every other video game of its era, which is not what you would expect from Bayonetta. There's this kind of fascinating interplay between the extremely ordinary for the time. Like, every video game looked like this. Like, almost everything I played on console that came out between, like, 2004 and, like, 2009, 2010, looked basically like this. It's almost exactly this kind of visual language and aesthetic. So it's interesting that something that is so weird in so many ways is so mundane in so many other ways. But, um... Things be how be they... <laughs> things be how be they be... Th what? Uh, okay. Right, uh, now that I've remembered how to talk like a human being, um, yeah, it's just, it's kind of curious. If you played any kind of action-y game, PC games, or PC-focused ones, less so, but there was, there's a kind of a very specific Japanese action-y console game aesthetic, which this exactly fits into. Um, even the kind of baroque elements seem to complement it somehow. Now these guys are going to explode in a second. They're awful and I hate them. Because, uh, yep, it's these guys. The worst enemies in the game, the ones I hate by far the most. And, uh... I don't even... Oh, hey, I got... That's amazing. I've never seen that happen. I can't believe I trapped one of them on the other side of a door. He clipped through it like a dickhead. Um... But yeah, this is a tough fight, unless you manage to corner one of them right at the start, because of course, as I said previously when fighting these guys, you can't use Witch Time, and um, their attacks will strip away all of your magic power almost instantaneously, which means good luck getting a Torture Attack to finish them off quickly. Um, it's always a lot easier once you've knocked one of them down, at least. Um, also, that particular combo with the... Uh, floor sweep kicks is really useful because uh, it locks them into that stun for a longer time than most of your attacks. Um, and of course the, the final hit tends to end with them facing away from you, which is to your advantage when you're fighting something that is faster than you and can lock you into combos. Are those, like, dissolved witches? Or is this like... So, we were speculating about blood rituals to summon angels. Is that essentially a, um entire supply of thousands and thousands of people's blood for the purpose of this ritual? Which, um, in terms of industrialized horror, is pretty pretty interesting. The, uh, the little stakes over the hearts are a nice touch. It's very kind of... Yeah, okay. It's very kind of vampiric, which is not in keeping with the character of the rest of this stuff. Um, they're also reminiscent of Bayonetta's Iron Maiden torture attack, which is 
Possibly just because they use the same kind of model basis, or possibly it's just a deliberate uh, reference to the fact that she has that ability. You remember how much trouble I had fighting these things at the start? Just nothing now. Um, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about this game, is that you have a very strong measure of your own skill over time. Did they break a hole in this window? Can I go out here? No. Um, the first time you encounter most enemies, they're relatively tough and hard to beat, and by the end of the game you're just absolutely dumpstering them constantly. Which I appreciate greatly, as someone who, is, who enjoys dumpstering things. Especially things that I thought were tough previously. Uh, however, these are still a pain in the ass to fight. I cannot stand these things at all. I hate them so fucking much. I think they're the only ones in this combat. Um, fortunately, you can hit them with each other. Oh god, it's more of these guys. Now, I'm not sure about this, but they look higher res than the previous times I fought them. I don't know if there's some kind of like special... Um, fancier, glossier character model for the ones in this level in particular, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them for, you know, building up to the finale in that way. So, uh, I was tapping completely the wrong button for this. These are still actually the easiest torture attacks to get a high score on, though I don't know why that is the case. Why they should have chosen these ones? Maybe it's a reward for how frustrating they are to fight in general. Um, but yeah. Unlike all the tapping ones, it's a spinny one. So... So, uh, as I said, this is a boss rush level, and we're about to fight the first boss, by which I mean the second boss of the game, but the first boss in this level. It's our old buddy Temperantia. Now, I'm not sure why Fortitudo isn't the first boss you fight here. He really never does show up again in the entire game. And I don't know why that is. Um, I guess it could be something to do with the character of... Um, well, he's the virtue of temperance, so perhaps he is like, eh. Like, uh, let's not get all broken up about this, guys, you know? There's no reason to th pull out all the stops to fight this one specific witch for some reason. But... Um, the other ones don't particularly seem to embody their virtues in any great respect. Uh, that said, Temperantia does... Ugh, not temp no, Wait, Temperantia is Temperance. Fortitudo is the first one. So, really he should be... Um, the most stoic of them. And he's really not. He's kind of snippy. So, they don't embody their virtues in any way, so I have no idea why he doesn't come back again. He came back in previous chapters. Which I guess means that all of them come back at certain points, but, um... He doesn't come back for this one. Also, uh, fun fact, if you hold down, it auto-fires, but that's a lot slower than hammering the buttons, so... If you want to take care of this boss quickly, which you do, because it's not very fun, um... The trick is... Just absolutely hammer that button as fast as possible, shoot him in the face a million times. It's nice to see, you know, Bayonetta firing a howitzer. It's kind of out of character in a way that's very amusing. She's very hands-on most of the time. It'd be more in character for her to lift and throw a howitzer at a boss than to actually just sit on it and fire. But um, you actually can dodge out of... Uh, not that smash attack particularly, but the rockets you can dodge out from underneath. Which preserves you and your uh, chosen cannonry of choice. Oh, this is going to be... and there we go. Yes, okay, good. That's really hard to dodge because the timing is um, kind of hard to predict, but... Uh, so he's going to go down in a minute, and that'll be the first one of the boss rush taken care of. I'm not sure if he can... I think he destroys... If you don't kill him fast enough, he will destroy a second cannon because there's a third one just around the way, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't quote me. Um, even though I'm eminently quotable, of course. And that is all for him. It's a fun fact, but uh, the spiritual wavelength of uh, these bosses is actually much the same as that of dynamite, which is why they explode when exposed to the human world. 
Now, luckily I have in fact remembered that <laughs> I needed to backtrack here. On my last practice run, I completely forgot, so I skipped the only Alfheim portal in this entire chapter, which is not a clever thing to do. So, naturally the only Alfheim chap the only Alfheim portal in this chapter, and I think the the penultimate one in the game, there's one more after this, is uh is naturally hidden behind a backtrack all the way to the very start of the level, uh, which is infuriating. Oh hey, I always forget that I have that equipped for extra move speed, but it's not as fast as this, so. But yeah, I have uh, talked at length about my hate for backtracking as a, like, mechanical, as a way of hiding things mechanically, because honestly, <sighs> It's not fun to have to remember to backtrack to find secrets. And it's especially not fun to have to do that in the context of a game that constantly locks off previous sections. So, so of course, if you are uh, looking for... If you want to find everything yourself instead of looking it up in a, in a tutorial, then you will have to spend ages backtracking every couple minutes because you never know when something is going to lock off. Hi there, this is Future Tessa for what may be the second to last, the penultimate time, uh, in this entire run. I think there's only one more of these portals left after this one. And is it just me, or is past Tessa getting kind of, uh, greedy with regards to her airtime? She already has the vast majority of it, and now she's actually cutting into my little interludes? All I get are these brief moments. I think that's quite unfair. And speaking of unfair, I did find this challenge fairly difficult. Um, it's not one of those ridiculous ones that took me 15 tries. Uh, I think this took me 3 or 4 tries. But, um... It's not, like... It's not difficult in theory, it just doesn't have much room for, um... Much room for failure. Since these enemies are on fire, if you hit them with anything other than a Wicked Weave, they will uh, do damage to you. And you, of course, only have 5 hit points in this challenge. Additionally, uh, lacking witch time means that you can't go into witch time to hurt them, so it's very easy to um, accidentally take some damage by doing that. Beyond that, there's not a ton to say. Um, there's those particular difficulties combining to make it more difficult than it would otherwise be. Also a fairly strict time limit. It's more generous than a lot of the time limits in these challenges, but it is also lengthy and tedious to work your way through, just uh, spamming the easiest Wicked Weave attacks over and over. There is a uh, one little trick that I think is very useful. If you can make, if you can contrive to use a uh, torture attack on one of the staff bearing, I suppose the pole arms with the... I don't know if there's actually like a hit point difference or anything between the um, different kinds of angels based on whether they're the flaming ones or not, but the flaming ones have slightly different and more ornate weapons. Instead of a staff, they have halberds. So if you can contrive to use a torture attack on one of the ones with a halberd, you get to do this, which makes the second phase significantly easier. Um, I'm not actually sure if these guys count as on fire or if you can damage them freely. I didn't want to take the risk on my practice run, but it looks like I did it here, so it's probably fine. Um, so yeah, one of these rare instances where a later phase is uh, easier than the earlier phase. But yeah, that's really all there is to say. There's not a ton more than that. If you can, spin to win. So I guess I'll reluctantly hand it back to past Tessa. Well, that was a tough one. Um, that actually... hmm. I think that's the last heart in the game, so I wonder if I've missed some going through, actually, or if that's as big as your health bar ever gets. Uh, anyway, that is the end of... well, it's not quite the end of this episode, I'll just get back to where I was. Normally I would edit this sort of thing out, but um, it gives me an opportunity to ramble briefly, uh, which would be cool if I had anything to say. But um, yeah, it's it's... Interesting that for a game that had so many bonkers ideas, like... Because I've made it clear the whole way through, this game is bananas, like... 
there's a lot of weird creativity in it and a lot of very strange concepts and a lot of a radical escalation that I really enjoy. But so many of those aspects are also paired with kind of low-key boring decisions, <laughs> game design-wise. Um, and uh, low-key boring decisions, visual design-wise. There are so many parts of this game that look identical to every other game that came out within, you know, several years of it. The Island in the Sun. The Ithaval Group, once a medium-sized IT company- Excuse me? I thought this was like a century-old secret organization. If it's an IT company, it can't be more than a decade or two old. What the fuck? Uh, through acquisitions has broadened its business base and become one of the world's leading conglomerates. Their base of operations is on a man-made island off the coast of Vigrid known as Isla del Sol. Isla del Sol was initially constructed to concentrate Vigrid's urban functions in one area and facilitate expansion. However, its true function is to funnel enormous power to the ruling authorities, creating an autonomous region under Ithaval group control in order to facilitate the creation of a theocracy. Gee, and I thought ordinary uh, gentrification was sinister. The CEO of the Ithaval Group, claiming to be a descendant of the Lumen, has used his economic and political strength, even exploiting the faith of the people, to bend Vigrid to his will. That is how he was able to influence the construction of the island as well as the city's urban planning to match his own religious views. Buildings were lined up as if they were an enormous spiral drawn to the centre of the island, a symbol of the trinity of realities known as the Cosmos of Chaos. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff being dropped in these uh, notebooks that is just absolutely uncommented on and absolutely wild. Amongst these urban structures, there are SAM-equipped strategic defence sites known as Gielahorns, tall buildings creating a skyward barrier that is nearly impregnable. At the centre of this curtain of defence lays the Ithaval building, the heart of the Ithaval conglomerate. I've been able to obtain important information regarding the building itself. While it may be the outward symbol of the city's wealth and pride, the inner sanctum of the building is home to advanced energy research that the Ithaval CEO is secretly using as leverage in the hopes he will remake the world according to his vision. It sounds absurd, but I've seen things on that island so strange that I believe it now with all my heart and soul. So, that seems like a peculiar attitude to have, my dude. Um, anyway, this seems like a good stopping place, so I'm just going to smash this open and uh, dodge a falling elevator. Which... Yep. Awfully convenient, isn't it, that whenever I need to go up a wall there just happens to be a uh, big moon. So, this looks pretty reasonable, right? Completely ordinary and normal thing for a person to do. Anyway, that's going to be all from me for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.